Paul. So what should we be thinking about the, your, your report in, in the bigger picture? These companies who are clearly racing to, to get their liquidity in order in one way or the other and what the ramifications of it will be. Well, I guess two things. I mean, one is some some kind of silver lining here, so far at least, seems to be that the banking system is holding up pretty well. They are lending, um, despite the fact that the numbers have been somewhat astronomical. I mean, just for context, and we cite this in our story, Fed numbers uh, that were compiled by Autonomous Research show that in a single recent week, the week ending March 18th, which is the most recent for which we had it available, the new loans in the system from banks amounted to $243 billion, And that is normally what you would, twice what you would see in a standard year over the last 20 years. So the, the activity is enormous, but the banks seem to be lending and holding up fairly well. What's, what's striking, though, is it just quantifies for you what we feel anecdotally to be true, which is that companies, a range of them, uh, companies with junk bond ratings like Yum, Yum Brands the other day in a deal that was actually oversubscribed, even though it was the first junk bond offering since March 4th, um, as well as investment grade companies, companies that arguably shouldn't need the capital or could hold off, uh, are, are going to the public markets. And they're also tapping bank lines of credit or tapping into revolvers which revolvers were long regarded as the ultimate rainy day emergency measure. And, and to be sure, some of these companies are in emergency times, but others are not quite there yet, and they're just trying to shore up their balance sheet. So I think although that's an additional drain on the system, that could give investors some comfort. I wonder also, though, the, the other side of it, though, the, the amount of money, Kate, that the banks are lending to these companies who are trying to get cash. This, we're not just talking about accessing the credit markets, obviously. Um, if that can come back and haunt the banks in, in, the, in the long run, if this crisis gets, gets even worse than we already uh, worry about. Sure, so I mean, if this continues, it, it obviously could start to be much more of a drain. And although the banks have been through stress testing ever since the financial crisis um, under much kind of stricter um, auspices to, to check their leverage uh, ratios and to check their capital buffers and to, to check their overall health. Um, it, it was said to me by a number of people, nobody ever expected to see these company revolvers drawn en masse uh, in, a, in a given situation. So I, I think we're not there yet, but I do think that over time, if this activity continues, it could start to be an issue. And you saw in the commercial paper markets and other short-term financing markets recently that there was a lot of dislocation and spreads were extremely wide. And that was because banks were deploying balance sheets to deal with some of these credit revolvers um, as opposed to being able to put money into these other shorter-term markets. So, for example, the head of the chair of the investment banking practice at J.P. Morgan, Carlos Hernandez, has been telling people recently he wouldn't be surprised if corporations – went through a kind of tough reckoning with their balance sheets and their their reliance on relatively short-term funding like commercial paper mm. which frequently uh, has a duration of about a year or less although it can be um, on the longer side um, and and trying to look to longer term liquidity sources let, let me Jim Kramer is with us today Kate uh, fortuitously for sure since we're having this conversation so Jim why don't you weigh in uh, on Kate's reporting from the, 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 the corporate perspective, but also the banking side, we know that the, that the, the banks have gone through, you know, umpteen thousand stress tests. And, and you talked to Corbett, the, the CEO of Citi, earlier today. How are you thinking about all of this? Well, uh, first, I also congratulate Kate and my old friend Peter Evis, who worked with me at, uh, at the street. It doesn't, Peter doesn't get enough credit. He's one of the greatest supporters of the world. I, when I read this piece, which was so excellent, I came down to there's, it's a downer, 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 as it should be, because the, there's a lot of risk. But we get to the third to last paragraph. And it said, uh, you've got this uh, assistant professor from Wharton, Peter Conti Brown, don't know him. The Fed has to violate its own regulations uh, to turn down the very businesses that are most in need of its interventions. I think that the Fed reads you, Kate. This is a different Fed from the previous <laughs> days where they would like, hey, listen, right. the journalists, what do they know? I think the Fed, I think that this time you've got Jay Powell. By the way, you got Steve Mnuchin. These are people who read the journal. They read the Times. They read your piece. And they say, you know what? 
we are not going to let what they write about happen. We can head this off. Michael Corbett this morning talking about how he's in constant contact, that they can head this off. They won't be so bad. And the difference between this one and 2007, 2009 is that 2007, 2009 happened. So it's entirely possible that this mess of the revolvers that you chronicle so well, it may not be the mess because maybe we see suddenly that the 10 worst loans are taken by the Fed because they read you. And that's the great thing about the, about the government and the Fed this time. They are not academics. They are not saying that Kate Kelly and Peter Rivas don't know anything. What they're saying is, I read that piece, and you know what? i got to be ready to buy those bad loans as much as I don't want to. Heck, maybe i got to take a stake in Carnival Cruise. I don't know. But that is the virtue. Keep writing these pieces. They read them. They take action. They refuse to know nothing. They insist on knowing something. What a pleasure. And as much as we may say, you know, think that Bernanke in the end got us out of it, he was tone deaf for two years. Not these guys. They're reading your piece and they're saying, we got to get that so it's under control. And that's the difference between now and 2007 and 2009. You're writing. Kate, I'm going to give you well, the Jim, last word, then I got to go. Thanks so much. And, and Peter is a gem, um, my co-writer on this. This is the second financial crisis we've covered together, um, if, if one would call it that. Um, but, Jim, that's a great point, and I think you're referring to um, – one of the Fed rules, which is that a company has to be current on its so-called undisputed debts in the 90 days before an emergency loan program. And as we understand it, the government is debating whether they can find some leeway here and uh, bring aid to some of the companies that most need it, even if they're violating some of the strictures of that policy. Um, and it does seem that the government has been relatively nimble and open to solutions here, as we saw through the CARES Act. So. I think there is a recognition of the, the suddenness and the shocking and profound impact of the crisis. And, and it seems um, that the banks are doing their part so far. But, yeah, I mean, there are going to be many more legs to this stool.